Thank you for having me. This is um, really lovely. We're kind of co-hosting. We've just sorted out some tech things. I'm not used to um, what we're we using Teams. I'm not used teams. To that so uh, <laughs> it's quite nice though. I quite like it. Um, so thank you very much for having me. And um, we're going to talk about your recipe for success with preschool classes today to leverage your preschool classes so that you can grow your school and keep your teachers happy. Um, that's also important. Um, so my mission with uh, Vanilla Preschool Dance is to help dance teachers get the right ingredients with their preschool dance classes so that they can meet the growing demand of this age group. Um, so you can earn more as a dance school owner and so your teachers can have more opportunities, particularly in daytime hours, because they want that <laughs> generally, um, and to earn more income and to have the opportunity to do that in daytime hours. And I really just as well, just really want to best serve our littlest dancers across, across the land, across the world, all the families that cross our paths with our dance schools from this very little age. Um, I just want to make sure that we're serving them the very best we can. Um, and, and so I'm here to serve you today to help us do that. Um, and you might already be thinking, well, I've already got a big waiting list for preschoolers like, like I do. Um, we're going to be talking about that today and what you can do to um, to help manage that um, as well. And that's where Love Admin, Admin might come in too. Um, OK, so this is going to be your recipe for success. There's four ingredients that your teachers can bring to the table or be developing. And that's quite an important point. I strongly believe that we might not always have teachers who've got all these things but they can be developing um, some of these ingredients, some of these skills. And then four ingredients for you to bring to the mix. And then, cause I kind of got a bit of a baking, it was originally ice cream, but I've got a bit of a baking thing going on. Um, <laughs> we're gonna mix it all up. And then we've got some actions for you to take today. So you should go away today. I, I, everyone should take at least one thing they can take away today to um, improve their offering of preschool dances, to, or to really help manage how they manage their preschool dances, um, dance school classes to um, help grow your school. So um, whether you've got a waiting list or you're just starting out figuring out what to do with preschoolers, um, what I say can be applied to you or your teachers, whether you plan your own classes between you or on your own, or whether you use some kind of syllabus, because obviously there's loads of, I mean, it's there's been this explosion, hasn't there, in um, franchises and licensed syllabus as well, um, which a lot of people love, that's fine. I do know a lot of us quite like to just make our own things as well, but what I'm gonna say today could apply to both of those. So um, don't think it's only for one or the other. And we'll look at these eight ingredients um, and then uh, there'll be some Q and A at the end. Um, so um, yeah, let's move on really briefly about me once upon a time i had no idea what i was doing with this with this um, age group i will freely admit i i'd never really been around small children <laughs> before apart from being one i was absolutely clueless when i started 19 years ago um i was uh yeah just given some preschool classes as part of my first teaching job all i really wanted to do was teach advanced modern and ballet uh, and a little bit of tap tap isn't my specialism particularly i can if i have to <laughs> Um, I try and have a growth mindset about that. Um, but yeah, I really struggled. And I just thought I wasn't a little kid's person. I just thought that I wasn't a little kid's person. I think that's probably how a lot of people think. But I kind of thought, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> Which is hilarious, of course. I just thought, well, I've got these CDs that I was given because that's how, how old I am. <laughs> and I'll put those on and uh, I'm sure it'd be fine. And they'll love what I do because they're only little. So they're going to love whatever we do. And of course, it doesn't go like that. It doesn't go like that. So very quickly, I realised, oh, crumbs, I'm going to have to get to grip with this. And it was my biggest challenge. And of course, some of you probably heard, sometimes your greatest struggle becomes your greatest strength. That's the journey I went on. I really kind of put my mind to it and um, had to figure out how to make these classes run more smoothly. Ooh, come back to the right one. So I had to kind of work out the art and science behind teaching three and four year olds and I couldn't find much training. I really couldn't find much training. I'd love to know in the chat box, could you let me know, do you think there is a gap in training to teach preschool dance classes? I would love to know if you agree with me. Definitely. Oh, I can't actually see it. There we go. Someone's saying definitely. Thank you, Performance Hub. This was something that uh, I kind of figured out over the years. A lot of syllabuses to pay out for. Yeah, and a lot of them are good. A lot of them are good. Um, there's a lot of good in them. 
Um, but there isn't there isn't much is there particularly to actually help you learn how to teach this age group. It's covered um, obviously all the different um, dance examining boards, different brands have their own way of um, approaching this. Um, but I don't feel like, yeah, there's that much. No training if you want to make your own. That's that's exactly why, why I started Vanilla Dance. So I'm here for you. Um, OK, so there wasn't much training. And this is back in the dark ages when the Internet was very new. <laughs> so there was not even much resources. There weren't even all the kind of, um, uh, you know, the music out there and things like that and all the different ideas that you can download now if you want to get some ideas. So I shadowed another teacher who was amazing with little ones. Um, I was incredibly lucky. The people that I worked for were both very good with little ones. And um, talking to them and other teachers just figured out what were the things I needed to work on. So I worked out how to plan the actual content in my classes, how to kind of reflect on each class, what went well, what, what didn't. Um, some of you probably know the, the term reflective practice, which is what we should all be doing and how to own the room and I call it owning the room because it works really well for PRO Pro um, and so uh, how to really kind of engage with little ones how to manage a class of little ones um, so I went on kind of upward spiral of competence and confidence and you know as you do things more you get more competent and confident um, and I started to create themed classes my first one was Cinderella and I kind of it, it went so well suddenly it was such a difference in how I'd sort of planned this class to how the other classes have been going um I thought oh, okay I'll try and do that again do it with another theme so I started doing that and I worked out how to talk to kids which was obviously very useful um and things went started to go better but I still kind of felt and particularly as actually as the kind of internet exploded more and there were a lot more things online um, you could start you started to sort of see a lot more things popping up about preschool classes about content for preschool classes I felt like oh maybe I'm not that good at this I kind of had terrible imposter syndrome because I felt like there was this impression that you have to be a Disney princess naturally which I know it's hard to believe that I'm not but um, <laughs> uh, I'm not really it's not my that's not my natural way of approaching classes um, and I'm not 100 miles an hour lots of props lots of kind of fireworks never ending kind of showtime that's not my approach and there is a lot of popular advice out there around this which I think gives people that impression I'll talk about that in a minute but basically what I decided a few years ago is that what we really need to do is decide what what children actually need what do children actually need? What do dance schools need <laughs> in order to really leverage these classes? But but also what do children actually need? So here's some um, popular advice you might have heard or you might give this advice. You might agree with all these things. Um, I don't particularly. Everyone's got a different view. It's fine. Everyone's got a different approach. This is part of what I'm about is everyone's got a different approach to teaching this age. But there are some core essential ingredients that we all need to have. So. Um, you might agree with some of these things. Children have changed nowadays. We have to reflect the fast pace of life that they're used to in our classes. You have to keep the music running all the time, use loads of props. You have to keep up to date music. I hate it when people do this, but I'm going to do it up to date music. Um, and stickers and bribery are necessary. Now, that's controversial because I know for a fact there'll be people that use stickers and, you know, it's fine. Uh, it's just not for me. <laughs> I don't particularly believe in it, but if they work for you, it's fine. Um, so this might be some advice you've heard or even give or encourage, and that's okay. But my question for you is, this is what's really important. What do your teachers think and what is their approach? And is it the same as yours? Do they have much guidance from you on how they actually deliver whatever content you've got? We'll talk about actually creating content as well, but do they actually have much guidance on how to run their classes? So this is how I started um, Below Dance. OK, and also just consider they might not know how to ask for help if they're not sure. They might actually be a bit unsure how well they're doing um, and just not really be Feel that they can ask for some help around it because they, there's this kind of expectation isn't it sometimes when you go into a job you're expected to know everything and be good at everything already we say this to our students you know sometimes they're struggling I can't do it and it's like well you know you wouldn't be here if you already knew how to do everything you'd be doing stuff on your own um, and it's the same with our teachers they'd be running a school themselves if they knew how to do everything not that we know how to do everything right okay so the first ingredient is creativity imaginative transitions so for your teachers to be developing not just 
ideas of things to do and I do see that phrase pop up a lot on social media I need ideas of things to do with preschoolers and I always want to kind of jump in and say it's not about necessarily the ideas of things to do actual activities to each bit of music yes that's important the important thing is how you actually link all of those things so if you think about um if you ever listen to uh, the radio or watch telly and uh they just don't quite get the segue right between something. It's always really funny, isn't it? The one show, I don't really get to watch that. We probably don't get to watch that as dance teachers, but I hear about it a bit um, uh, if you're in the UK. Uh, there's certain things that it go from one thing to another and it just doesn't quite work. And sometimes we can have that in our classes where we're doing something lovely and then um, we kind of finish that and we'll go, right, so now we're going to, <laughs> and you want to avoid those moments as much as possible, especially with preschoolers. Um, you really, really need to be thinking about how you link one activity to the next. And this is vital so that the class flows and keeps them engaged throughout. We all know that's kind of speed bump feeling, but it can feel a bit clunky. So um, let's give you a small example. I use stories, I've mentioned landscape seasons. So for example, this week we're doing our kind of springtime uh, lesson and part, a lot of that is to do with sunshine and rain. And we do making the sunshine and we do rain clouds and making puddles uh, and pitter patter raindrops, etc. So we might do the sunshine, we might make sunshine, spread the sunshine around, it's quite a nice way to say it, um, and we make some showers. Now we've had the sunshine and we've had the rain, wonder if you know what can that sometimes make if we're really lucky we might see something what can it sometimes make now some of them won't know they'll know about rainbows but they won't necessarily know that sunshine and rain makes rainbows but you can talk about that as a kind of linking transition to then do something to do with rainbows um and you might do something with ribbons across the body going across the body is a good idea um or you know it's all sorts of things you can do to do with rainbows but then when you've done the rainbows you could say something like now, we don't always get a rainbow. Sometimes we, we get sunshine and rain and it, we don't get a rainbow, but that's OK, because I wonder if you know what else can it do down there in the ground? What does the sunshine and rain make? Does anybody know? I wonder if you know. And then you can talk about flowers growing and pretty much they'll always come up with that answer and you can do being flowers now this obviously is not groundbreaking I'm very aware that what I'm saying a lot of you will be like well yeah I do that <laughs> great good keep doing it are you doing it all the time and have you got that approach really really clear for your teachers this is what's really really important do your teachers do this so could you put in the chat box one to ten a number one to ten ten being Oh my goodness, yes, of course, we have literally got a script or, you know, a phrase, something that imaginatively, imaginatively and kind of logically links each activity in our preschool classes. It's all planned out for all of our classes, 10, down to one. I haven't really thought about this at all ever. So if you would put that in the chat box, that would be helpful. Someone's had their coffee this morning and is on that chat. <laughs> so I realise this is not particularly groundbreaking stuff. <laughs> musical theatre classes, five. OK, yeah, you could do it with musical theatre classes, definitely. Yeah, five, sometimes, sometimes. Some exercises link, some don't. You can make all of your classes flow and link them up so that it becomes easier for the teacher and for the kids. You can definitely do it, but five's not bad. Five isn't bad. That's a really good start. Um, okay. So do you have teachers who find managing a class of preschool is a bit challenging or might they, but just not be saying so? <laughs> um, I was fairly open. I'm quite a heart on my sleeve kind of person. I was fairly open with the people I work for and just got help because um, that's the kind of person I am. Um, but not everybody is like that. Um, so do we really know the importance of planning? Do our teachers know the importance of planning? Good delivery happens more consistently when you've got something consistently great to deliver. Plan so you can play. And 
you can play around with your planning and it's actually quite fun. I had a lot of fun the other morning on a one-to-one -one call with someone coming up with a new theme. Um, most of it was her ideas really actually. <laughs> she just needed a few prompt questions. She came up with loads of ideas um, and it, yeah, it's quite fun, but it is really important you do plan. Um, your class is going to run more smoothly if you've planned it well, particularly with this age group. You can't rely on magic moments just happening. It's not about just being someone who's good with little ones, even if you are someone who's naturally good with little ones. Um, you can't rely on these moments just happening and it all running smoothly. Sparking their imagination is about helping paint a picture in their head. So you've got to have that picture in your head, first of all, and plan those details out. I mean, there's actually, you can probably tell I don't have a problem talking. I can probably talk about everything we do in, in loads of detail in class, um, but I just want to spark their imagination. So I have to have that picture in my head and help draw it out of them so that they've got it in their head. Um, and also, do you know, I was just listening, you're going to laugh at this. I was listening to um, Desert Island Discs the other day, because I am quite old and I like Radio 4 and Desert Island Discs. And um, a comedian, Dara O, oh, is it Dara O'Brien or O'Brien? I can never remember. Um, and he was talking about, this is how he remembers his comedy routines. It's how he learned how to do comedy, was not necessarily trying to remember every word of every piece, but he would remember how he segued them, how he linked them, his transitions between each piece, and then he could do it. And for a lot of people, including myself, that is how I remember my classes. I can, I mean, I have been doing this for a long time, but I can, even with a new thing, because I've, I've um, created one or two or developed one or two slightly different recently, I can go in and because I know how I'm going to link things, I know what order it is. So I don't have to keep checking. I might have to occasionally check what's next, but pretty much I don't have to keep going and checking what's next, checking my notes, checking my playlist. So I'm not taking myself away from that focus with the class and I don't lose them. Um, and so you're creating like a narrative arc. Some of you might know if you're about, if you've done much to do with film or uh, writing, um, you know, English students or whatever, if you've done much um, about creative arts generally, you'll know this thing about a narrative arc. Um, and so that's what you want really, is to take them on a journey through the whole class. It should be a kind of journey into a landscape, a season, uh, a story. Obviously stories are easier because you literally tell the next bit of the story. That's how I created the Cinderella one because it was like, well, let's just work our way through the story. Um, so that's always a good place to start. Um, but that's what you want to be creating. So yeah, making it easy to remember, making it better for the kids to keep engaged. Um, and if you've got teachers who don't feel naturally imaginative or magical, I actually did a whole workshop at um, the Dance Business Conference, shout out for the Dance Business Conference this um, August, if, you, if there are any tickets left in Birmingham. Um, when I delivered a workshop there, this is what I talked about, um, creating magical classes. You don't have to feel be someone who feels magical. Um, I would just draw a blank years ago and think, how do I feel 30 minutes? <laughs> now I'm like, oh, I can't fit everything into 30 minutes. Um, but I would draw a blank and I'd be like, what do I do with them for 30 minutes? And it would feel like I was babysitting, which is it should never feel like that for any teacher. And that isn't really, of course, delivering something great to the kids either. If you haven't got a starting point, if you haven't got a method to know how to plan classes, um, then you're going to be a bit stuck, aren't you? And this is why a lot of people do go down the franchise or licensed syllabus route. And it works for a lot of people because um, that's that they need something to kind of start with. And it can be particularly useful for, for younger teachers, for them to have some stuff ready done so they can work on just connecting with the kids. Um, OK. It doesn't all have to be fluffy unicorns and rainbows and flowers and pretty fairies and I say that a bit tongue-in-cheek because that's not me at all um <laughs> and if you that's you that's fine and obviously you know I mean I don't know if kids wear any clothes that don't have unicorns and rainbows on nowadays <laughs> so I was feeling that um and, and by the way when you ask them what color what color bubble should we make they all say rainbow and I go can you think of one color from the rainbow <laughs> which is just quite funny um but yeah, if you're not really kind of a, you don't think of yourself as a magical person, it's fine. It's fine. And this is partly why I've called it vanilla dance, because it's fine to be kind of plain and everyday. And I'll tell you why. 
kids really relate to everyday experiences, everyday objects, the things that they come in contact with. We think that, that all they want is unicorns, rainbows, fairies, princesses. Actually, they don't necessarily. What can really help you build connection with them, we'll talk about that later, is their everyday experiences. I, I don't know if anyone was on my workshop at the Dance Business Conference last summer, but um, so if you do, you, if you were, you'll know the answer to this. Does anybody know what the biggest, most important turning point is in the Lion King story? I'll be so impressed if anyone gets this. <laughs> but if you think about it, you might. In the Lion King, what's the most important turning point in the story? No one's writing in the chat. <laughs> Somebody's writing in the chat. It's actually something very mundane. Hint. Well, the professor dies. <laughs> yes, it's pretty horrible. But actually, the most important point in the in because it's all then really sad and it's horrible, and he goes off into Simba goes off into exile, and it's already sad. And uh, the turning point is the dung beetle. The dung beetle rolls his dung and it's got bits of Simba's hair in it or something, hasn't it? Or in the live version it has. <laughs> and Rafika goes, he's alive? Like that. And then it's like, oh, everything's gonna be okay because he's gonna find him and he's gonna come back and rule the kingdom. And it's all wonderful. So Disney are really good at this. They elevate the everyday. They turn the mundane into magical. And that's what we can do in our classes. I'd really like you to think about that today, what you can do to just use everyday experiences. Um, uh, there's a little free gift at the end of this, if you haven't already got it, my list of themes. There's like 60 different preschool dance themes. And a lot of it can be around quite everyday things because actually kids love all that. And you can be silly with it, like talking about poo. We did cow packs the other day. Um, you know, you can talk about silly things and they love that. Now you can't assume that your teachers know this or know how to do this. Um, so if you are assuming that, there might be a bit of an inconsistency in your classes that you're running. So we're going to talk about that next. Children need a consistent experience and you need a consistent method for planning in order to create it for them. You might want to just think about this, the, the imaginative transitions, do a kind of have a little think. Where might you be in that with your teachers, either your own planning or teachers planning? Is the, Have they got a starting point for how to do that? Um, either if they got guidance from you or could they get it from, from elsewhere? So your second ingredient on that thing is consistency. Stay with this idea that teachers need to have clarity on how to make class plans and make it all hang together. How consistent is each child's experience of your preschool dance classes or your preschool classes, if it's musical theatre or whatever, really, drama? Um, does every child get that same quality of experience every week? Now, this doesn't mean that every teacher must be doing the exact same thing every week and that you rule with an iron fist and, um, you know, and there's no deviation and they feel completely disempowered and not able to be creative. Um, but you do need to have a consistent approach to kind of stay on brand for your performing arts school, dance school. Um, and it makes it easier for everybody. I'll, I'll talk about each of these things. You're gonna need a kind of consistent description, your kind of approach. So I talked a bit earlier about what kind of is your approach to teaching preschool classes. Um, what's your aims? Is it particularly around preparing them for specific genres? Obviously ballet is something we do. My preschool classes only contain a tiny bit of ballet, but we wear a ballet uniform. That's part of my long description that I give to parents. Um, you know, is it musicality, mind, movement? Again, that's that's what we do. Um, what kind of themes do you use? We use stories, seasons and landscapes, but you might use just stories or fairy tales, or you might do, um, uh, you know, I don't know, superheroes or something, or, you know, um, jobs in everyday life. But what themes are you using? Um, what's your general approach? Do you have a description that you can make short or long, depending on how you want to use it? So you want a long description for your teachers and for you. You might use that long description in your inqui inquiry responses, your email, email responses to when people are inquiring. But you want to be able to make it shorter as well so you can put it on social media. Um, so think about that do you have like a long and short version that clearly describes 
a kind of paints a picture for people are what they're going to receive if they come to your classes paints a picture for your teachers you wouldn't ask someone to bake a cake without giving them an idea a recipe I want a chocolate cake you know or I want a something with meringue in it or um, you know you give them a recipe and a picture so that they know what they need to produce so you need to do that for your teachers it's also going to have this fantastic impact on your local families by drawing people to you who want what you provide because not everybody wants the same thing. Some people do want them in pink tutus and fairies and princesses. That's what they want for their kid. That's fine. And it's fine if you do that. It's not what I do. So I try to make it clear what we do. One of the things that we do is we emphasize um, learning how to learn, preparing them for school. So I include as much of the early years framework stage guidelines as possible. That's just something particular to the UK. I'm sure there's similar things um, uh, around different countries. Um, so we talk, I put in as much as I can about numbers, shapes, colours, everyday objects, animals, places, seasons, um, all of these things they're learning about the world and it pre helps prepare them for school. And obviously in the way you run your class might help prepare them for school as well. Um, I've just realised I'm a bit behind time, so I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. Have you got like a structure? So, you know, what's the shape of your cake mould um, that helps it all stand up so that and helps it all bake consistently um, rather than just like a big um, sort of lump in, in the oven? Um, have you got like a structure? Is there like a start and finish that you always do? And um, what kind of themes? Is there particular skills that you want to cover in your classes that teachers know they've got to cover? And this is again, it's going to really help your teachers. Do you have pull out plans and playlists that you can share with your team? More benefits on that coming later with room for them to add their own sprinkles. So I got that there. So you need to have a kind of consistent recipe that they can add their own creative sprinkles to, which will make them feel good, obviously. And give really clear expectations to your, to your teachers. You know, if you've got all this really clear, that's going to be being really kind to your teachers. They're not going to be kind of floundering, going, oh, I don't really know. I don't really know what I'm expected to do. Um, make sure you've got this recipe for them. OK, the other ingredients, I'm a bit naughty, I've put them together here because um, I kind of knew that I probably talked too long, so I've put them together. Um, <laughs> connection and calm. We need to help teachers understand preschoolers. Now, some of them, as I say, will already just naturally might have had younger siblings or cousins. They might just be naturally really good with kids. They might give the impression they are, um, but actually not feel that confident about it. Or they might just need to have a little bit more understanding about how to deal with um, unwanted behaviours and some of the perhaps slightly more challenging um, behaviours you can find in class and how to manage that. Um, do they need strategies for carrying a class? Yeah. Do they need um, ways of managing perhaps individual children or just how to manage a, a group? What's really important is that they find space in the class to connect with children, to create that connection that's going to make the parents happy, kids feel good, they're going to feel noticed, valued, they're going to feel seen and heard. So they come out of class feeling good, the parents pick up on that, they love that, they tell everybody how great it is, they want to stay with you, um, you know, and then you're building that connection, even if that child has a different teacher the following year they can transfer that sense of connection because they're expecting it um there's some stuff about attachment theory we could talk about that but we won't bother um but yeah you want to be building this sense of connection with your with your students so for your teachers to do that this is partly why i believe that we don't need to go 100 miles an hour i know it's I'm like popcorn in kettle black here but um uh we don't need to go 100 miles an hour in our classes we actually have to take time in those imaginative transitions to really connect with our students however we can and give them quite a calm experience um how many of us here from parents i think she's, oh, she's just really tired i think i hear that 50 times a week you know I, I hear that all the time she's just really tired because they are over scheduled and they are over I'm not blaming parents but this is our culture we're all over scheduled we're all over stimulated so what if we could create classes that gave some space for connection that gave a calm experience where they're able to learn how to learn and that better sets them up for life have your teachers got an understanding of that 
you might already get that and do that already, but have your teachers got an understanding of that? OK. <laughs> So do your, do your teachers need help shifting their mindset around this, seeing things from a little person's point of view? And do they perhaps just need some practical strategies? Now, these are the things that you're going to bring to the mix. This is where I've written 1030, so we're only a few, we're only a few minutes um, behind. Uh, and I've written slow down, vary my <laughs> pace, vary my voice, because these are things I teach other people. But when it comes to these things, I just go blah, 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 blah. Um, OK, so those are what your teachers need to be doing or developing. And for you, you need to be I'm kind of hammering this home now. You need to have a clear recipe, a clear kind of picture of what it is you want to deliver. But you also really importantly need to be ready to grow your capacity. Now, I've had waiting lists for years of like tons. I, my waiting list is always between about 50 and 100 just for preschool classes. I've got uh, 200 and something students overall in my dance school um but i've always got a waiting list of like 50 to 100 just for preschool classes so i'm doing something right um and you might have that as well i know i've got lots of friends who run dance schools they've got waiting lists if you're doing doing something right then you're going to grow and you're going to need to build your capacity and this is actually what i've been working on myself the past few years because for a long time i thought well no i'm the only person who's good at doing this now because i've worked out how to do it and, and i couldn't find anyone else who i thought could do it um but i've changed that I've, I've grown my capacity so that i can meet this demand and leverage these classes to get more income to grow my school so these are four things you can bring to the mix and i'll give you some um, action points and i might go a bit quickly um but there will be q a afterwards systems so we're here with love admin systems that help you manage your inquiries and grow your capacity so how are you collecting inquiries how are you organizing them how are you following up you might want to go away and find out from love admin or whoever you're using whatever crm software you're using um is there a way if you're not already doing this is there a way you can very finely filter age groups so that with all your inquiries as well as your current students and um, i actually yeah i have like loads of different categories um so that you can really clearly know straight away as soon as somebody says oh, i've got to i can't come anymore because we're moving or i've had to change my day um can you put me on the waiting list for x day um and you've got to then fill that space I can now do that like immediately. I can get someone booked in straight away because I've got a system for doing that. So all my inquiries are so organized. I know everybody's availability. Um, you know, can they only do Saturday? Can they only do Thursday? I've got it, it's all written down. So making sure that whatever data you collect is really, really consistent, informed, it's all there, and that you can bring it up really quickly and easily so that you can just get these things filled. You never want spaces just sitting there unfilled for any amount of time, um, especially if you've got waiting lists. Um, so no stone unturned is how I call this. I used to actually work in sales and recruitment um, and that was really what I learned doing that was that whatever data system you're using, it's only as good as what information is put in and how consistently it is used. It's only as good as what information you put in and how consistently it is used and that will help you to fill classes quicker so have a think about whether you can do this whether you can are there ways to kind of filter very quickly and easily different age groups now i actually have got so many kids i've already allocated all the reception spaces for september those kids that are moving up who are four or turning four now and moving up to reception I actually need to start growing my capacity for reception classes because they all they all come into our reception classes. And uh, so when any spaces that come up now for my classes, if anyone moves or leaves for any reason, then I can only add three year olds or people that are turning kids that are turning three between now and August because uh, I won't have a space for them in reception. Now that's my thing I've got to work on. I've got to grow my capacity for all of the other classes because nobody leaves us, <laughs> which is lovely. Um, so are you collecting, organising and following up systematically? No stone unturned. Is it watertight? What can you do to make it more watertight? I'm sure Love Admin will have <clears throat> a chat with you about how you could do that. 
um, it might be that you um, use some other kind of system, um, but just go away and find out what you can do with what you use. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that. And then consider all class options. This is what I've needed to do was think about, OK, where can I put in more classes? So could I put in more classes at the current venue I use? I'm in that place where I've been running my school for 10 years, our 10th anniversary this year. And, you know, you get in that like a uh, comfy zone where it's like, oh, I just don't really want to have to have another set of keys for somewhere else <laughs> and, uh, you know, bother with learning how to open and lock up somewhere else and deal with a different care caretaker and all that kind of stuff. So, it, you know, you might even have your own studio and it might be packed out, but could you maybe branch out into other venues as well? So I had to figure out, could I do more days and times uh, at my current venue and consider other days and times? Um, at one point in the pandemic, when we came out of COVID, I think I had five different venues on a Wednesday, not just for preschool, across my whole school. Um, but that was that was quite a lot to manage. Um, and I think it put me off <laughs> having other venues. But actually, it, this is the way to do it, is to make sure you've got lots and lots of kids coming in. You're creating capacity for lots and lots of these classes because we all know, this is what I didn't say at the start, we all know that as they go into school and they have more and more activities on offer, all these after school clubs, and then they have um, social events, parties, 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 and they discover the opposite sex or the same sex. But, you know, they're going to get interested in other things. So we know that they drop off. It's the nature of what we do. It's just the nature of what we do. At some point they do drop off. Mine tend to start dropping off sort of later uh, up into the grades. Um, we do pretty much keep all of them through all of our earliest classes um, through to the end of year two. Um, so because that's going to happen, it's natural, you need to create as much capacity here as possible. So I started an 8.15 class on a Saturday morning. I do know people that do earlier. Um, we know that they do like swimming at 7, 7.30, sometimes on a Saturday morning, because they, they've got so much to squeeze in at the local leisure centre, they start them early. We can do the same. People are up. Now, it's not always people's preference. Sometimes people will say, oh, 8.15 is a bit early. I said, well, do that one for now. And then I'll put you as next on the list for when a space comes up at 10.30. And they love that. So um, and then you have a system for managing that. Are there other venues, days and times? Um, that's something to consider. Consider all your team options. Really, really important that you do this. Could you have some open chats with any of your team who don't currently teach, currently teach this age, who might not think of themselves as a small child person, just like I didn't years ago? I'm really glad that I was made to teach this age group. I never would have chosen it, but I'm really glad because now it's like what I do and I love it. I actually love it. Um, it's taken a long time, but <laughs> there might be some teachers who could have the potential to be really great with this age group and you just haven't thought of it or they haven't thought of it. They perhaps haven't seen the benefits in terms of daytime hours, more income during the daytime. Um, do you just need to have a bit of an open mind? Do they need to have an open mind to kind of maybe pursue this and just think about whether they might want to do it? Is it that you're not sure, again, having a starting point, having some kind of method for planning classes? You know, are you uh, perhaps you don't use the franchises um, the license syllabus? Um, and so it's how are they going to create their own or how are you going to create it with them? So maybe that's what you need to do is get organised. Have you got maybe what you already deliver? Is that all organised digitally so that you can share it? I know some people love their stationery and notebooks. It's not me. I can't write for Toffee anymore. Everything has to be digital nowadays. I can barely write my parents' anniversary card. Um, get, get my husband to do it because he's got nicer writing. Um, so do you need to have everything digitally organised? And don't think to yourself, I run sort of ballet based classes. They're not really a ballet teacher or whatever it is, they're not really a musical theatre teacher. I've got two fantastic people on my team helping me run preschool classes who are only doing it because I asked them and because I said to them, I can see that you could be really good at this. It just needs a little bit of help and they just need a bit of shadowing. They need a bit of um, input in terms of actual content and they're flying and they're great. Um, one of them was um, is really a tap specialist. Um, but I knew that she would be quite good with this age group. She already had already had some of those skills in terms of interacting with little ones. And all she needed to be able to do was demonstrate a beautifully stretched foot and stretch feet when she skips. So I know she's demonstrating nicely and holding her skirt nicely and doing a nice Quran. And what else do we do? Arabesque um, and uh, 
skip Sarah Best Girl. It's, yes, few things. And if she could, you know, I could teach her to do that. She couldn't do it. <laughs> and she has got an extra class in. So she's got some more income. So try and have an open mind about who could do these classes. It might be you have know some ex-performers who might just want a bit of extra money on a, a weekday. Um, it might be, I've also got somebody assisting me at the moment who's one of my mums, who she did do performing training years ago. She did dance training. And she's sort of just dipping her toe in, really, to see if it's something she might want to do. She definitely could do. I could definitely um, assist her and give her the skills she needs, um, just kind of uh, mentoring her a little bit. Um, and it, it might, wouldn't take that much for her to then take on some classes if she wants to. I'm trying to persuade her at the moment. Um, so keep an open mind. OK, more action points. Well, this is kind of a summary, I suppose. Create consistency by looking after your team. So do you need to mentor them or do you just need to be clearer with them about what they need to make? Um, have you got a clear description, skills lists, uh, aims, themes? Have you got clear expectations of how they're going to deliver the class, how much creativity they can put in themselves? My teachers know that they're quite free to drop bits of mine and add other things in as long as they use an imaginative transition. Um, do you need to give them much hand-holding? Do you need to either shadow them, so be the assistant in their classes initially, or more likely, do they need to be the assistant in your classes a few times and then they'd rather just get on with it? That's probably how most people would rather do it. But, you know, it could be a bit of both and then just sitting down to chat about it to go through, reflect about how things are going. And ongoing communication. It might just be a bit of a leap for some for some teachers to, to leap into teaching this age group. Um, but it could be so beneficial for you and for them. It could really help you create capacity in your school um, and really then grow your school beyond that, that as you have that natural drop off, um, you're going to still have plenty of students for those kind of junior senior classes. So I have talked so much. I'm really, it's one of my best skills talking um, and I've given you lots of action points there. If anyone wants me to go back to them in a minute, I will. Um, the main training that I offer is to dance teachers. Dance studio owners can come on it as well. Um, I run a short course and I'm running it next Monday and Tuesday morning, but there will be recordings. You might want to come live to one and not the other or just, just get the recordings. Um, it's called Become a Preschool Dance Pro. And you've got the, um, can you see the QR code all right there, Lauren? Yeah. You're good? Okay. Yeah. Um, we're going into a lot more detail about the creativity consistency, calm and connection within classes. Um, it's for you or your teachers, really, if you need more lesson planning um, ideas, how to have like an easily repeatable process, of like an ABC method for um, planning classes for this age. And one client went away and created eight new themed class plans in like within a few weeks and um so that yeah it's it can work and then how about more about understanding little ones maybe it's just that they need a little bit more about understanding little ones from little ones point of view so that they get a better experience possibly um and maybe they just need some ideas for carrying a class you get downloadable tools with like a whole checklist of um, individual and group strategies for carrying a class along with you and managing onto behaviors so if you or one of your teachers would benefit, booking closes tomorrow um, and there will be recordings. So just um, the QR codes there. But if you just want something free, I've got this ultimate list of preschool dance themes. I say there's 60 on there. There's probably loads more, but that's what I came up with. Um, I actually only use 12 to 14 themes each year. Um, but, you know, there's, there's tons you could do. So you can grab that as well if you like. OK, Lauren. It's gone quiet in the chat because I haven't really asked <laughs> I've just been talking at people. Um, but yeah, we'll open it up to q and I'd love to know if anyone's got any questions or if they want me to go back to any of those slides. Okay. Has anyone got any questions for Fiona? I'd like to know what anyone is going to go away and do today. Is there anything you've thought today? Yeah, that's my takeaway. I need to go away and do that. I'd love to know what um, what's your takeaway from today. And it'll be different for everybody because everyone runs really different kind of schools, different setups and at very different stages. Going to look at my transitions through the classes. Great. 
Yes, maybe don't do Mufasa dying. <laughs> <laughs> good, that's good, Karen. Oh, that was you, Karen, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Someone else typing. So what do you think you personally can add more of in your classes? Really bad class last week. Oh, the babies, it made me reflect on why it didn't work. Yeah, now I'll, I'll put my hands up here. My specialism is with three to four year olds. Um, younger classes, um, I'm at, I have got a free Facebook group you can join. And I'm gonna do something about younger classes. Um, it's just like a free a free thing um, in a couple of weeks time probably, because a few people have said they'd like to have a, perhaps a sharing discussion about things that work with the kind of younger classes. Um, yeah, two to three, I think that is a really challenging age actually. Um, but a lot of this can be applied to that for sure about the transitions with parents, yes. And parents is a whole other ball game. Parents is a whole other ball game. <laughs> yes, parent and toddler classes, yes. Um, I don't actually run any. I'll tell you now, I'll put my hands up. I don't actually run any because I just like delivering the three to four year old classes. That's what I do. That's my specialism. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting one, the age group. But yeah, you can definitely apply some of these things. Anything else to do with the um, actually helping your teachers have a clearer idea of what to do? Um, any other questions about this age group or about keeping them or um, anything else about? creating capacity, taking on other teachers. I do actually do another another course for studio, dance studio owners about crafting your curriculum and pulling together a shareable set of plans and playlists and your recipe um, to share with your team. Um, and I did that last year for a couple of few different people and um, I might repeat that later this year if there's demand. Um, so that might be something you can get in contact with me about. Any other questions? Anyone else got things that they're gonna go away and do? I want to know what actions you're all going to take <laughs> on transitions. And reflecting, that's really good, Performance Hub, reflecting on what doesn't work. You, it's, it's the most awful thing if you have a car, any class of any age that you start to dread each week, which is where I was with preschool classes when I started teaching. Um, I just used to dread it, and uh, which is, is kind of crazy to me now because I love it so much. But um, it's horrible if you're, yeah, you, you're busy because we're so busy. So taking the time to actually figure out what went wrong. And sometimes it does take someone else to, to maybe look at it with you or talk through it with you. Um, I might be adding some one-to-one -one sessions soon, um, but that's probably going to be offered first of all to people that come to the course next week. And then, yeah, I'll see how much capacity I've got for that. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I've, I have been doing a bit of one-to-one, -one, so I can always do that with some people. I'm my, I'm my only teacher. I'm about to start using a senior student to assist. So great to think about how we can create together. Yes, you know, two, two heads are better than one. A couple of themes which I know work well every week. I think it's because it's more of a story through the whole session where all the exercises link. It, stories are such a great place to start, but you can create stories from all sorts of themes you if you brainstorm everything you can actually create a story from all sorts of themes definitely so go away and uh, see what how, how you can maybe make these little imaginative transitions in some of your other themes try and try and repeat it do i have a good album um yeah i you get the if you do the course you get a download list of albums i my go-to is all of the guy did and stuff which you probably have <laughs> give, him, give him a big shout out um guy did and d-e-a-r-d-e-n has got tons of stuff and i'm really everyone's different i mean sometimes we do a song we did a little chit chit chicken song this week for easter um which is very cute because it's quite hard words and so it's quite it's quite sweet i'm trying to trying to have a go at them um but uh, some people love doing songs. I really like instrumental music. Personally, I think it helps the kids to focus on you um, and focus on what they're doing. It gives them a bit more space. Um, that's just me, though. Um, recommendation. So, oh, uh, Guy Dearden, G-U-I, and Dearden, D-E-A-R-D-E-N. Personally, he's just got so many albums. And so, and so many of them relate to themes that you would do, like all those themes that I've I've come up with there that you um, can download. I'll go back to that. Um, a lot of them were 
ideas that I thought by looking just looking through his albums you know yeah oh you know yes you know him so um that's just how I approach it everyone does different you know if you're a musical theatre school and then so you're doing lots of songs then you know um it, it depends it's, it really depends on your style um everyone's got a very different style and different approach it depends on your demographic uh, it depends on you I really feel strongly that it feeling authentic to you is important so that's why as well it's, it's important to give some creative leeway to your teachers as well because rehearsing somebody else's choreography is never that fun <laughs> I had to make a teacher do that last year because I had a teacher had to leave very suddenly so we'd already started show work uh, with older students and the teacher had to come in and rehearse her show work which it was I just felt really sorry for her because that's never that much fun is it really um but a lot of your teachers just need this starting point okay we're doing this theme this is how we're going to link everything and they might do slightly different things um but yeah you just need to give them that opportunity to feel to feel like it's they can create it and make it theirs a bit in Spain language is a huge thing for songs and simple words actions is amazing yeah is that so if that's works really well for where you are that's great that's great Okay, so um, download that if you want to. I'll go back to this as well. Um, so booking closes for this tomorrow, but there will be recordings um, if you can't make it live. But please just, um, I'm on Facebook and Insta. I think I'm Vanilla Dance Fiona on Insta. Um, and it's Vanilla Dance or Vanilla Preschool Dance on Facebook. Um, and also, please, 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 if you go on my mailing list, um, if I say on an email, you know, hit reply and let me know, hit reply and let me know, because I really want to know how I can serve people best. Um, I really feel so passionately that, that the littlest students that we have deserve the very, very best and um, and that you deserve to really use these classes to grow your school. So, um, oh, good. Lovely, Debbie. Um, so. Yeah, please just, I'd love to know what else I can do to help people with all of this, because I just feel like, I don't know, this this might feel, I don't mean this in a horrible way, but I wonder if sometimes we're just so busy and because we get so many inquiries for preschool classes, we almost don't need to grapple with it. We almost think we don't need to grapple with it because we get so many inquiries. That's just a little suspicion I've got. Is that, someone tell me in the chat what they think about that. Is it almost as if we just don't need to get to grips with it because they're always going to be coming in? We're always going to have inquiries for this age group. Um, we never have to market for about, yeah. Uh, yeah, I say, I don't really have to do much marketing. I mean, you do put out some, you know, so that people know you run classes, but yeah, there's so much demand. And I think we're just keeping up with the demand can mean that we don't necessarily give the time we could to the actual content and delivery. It's just, yeah, I think we forget how clever this age are, how much they know what they like and don't. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're quite different as well. <laughs> they're very different as well. That's it. But I do think there are just core, some core things that they, they do need. They mostly just need to feel good and they mostly need to feel seen and heard. And they need things that they can relate to, their everyday experiences. And um, that's what's the same for all children, for sure. And they need to feel safe. They need to feel safe in order to be able to learn. So um, we go into that a bit more in, in my in my course. Right, Lauren, I've talked a lot, haven't I? <laughs> no, it was great. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's got loads of takeaway points. I was just going to say, Fiona, I'm going to email the recording out to everybody just after this anyway. But if you send me the links to your group, I can directly link in the email for them to join okay. for the course and stuff. OK, cool. Yes, Amazing. I will do pop something over to you thanks Perfect. so much for having me thanks for listening to me for all this time everybody <laughs> go give your ears around right now <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for joining thank you you're welcome you're so welcome Okay.